It's good to be here in San Francisco. If you made it through the hackathon, congratulations. I know it can be an exhausting event, but bring the energy today, all right? We're going to talk about the blockchain operating system. Now, as Happy Money Man said, I am Rob Finch. I'm the CEO of Cypherglass, one of the EOS block producers. So we've all heard of an operating system, but I think it would behoove us all to define it. So what is an operating system or an OS? According to Everpedia, which is a great EOS project, an operating system is system software that manages computer hardware and software resources and provides common services for computer programs. It's a little bit of a, a convoluted definition there, but I'll get back to that. But the one point I want to bring out on Everpedia is that applications or apps usually require an operating system to function. That means in order to use all of the apps that you have on your phone today, in order to use the apps and, and build the apps that you have on your computer at home, it all requires an operating system. You have to let the user and the developers interface with the computer in some way. And we're all familiar with this, of course. We have Mac OS, we have Windows, we have Linux, all these different operating systems that we use in computers today. And ultimately, these operating systems enabled computer apps to finally become mainstream. For the first time, people all around the world, thanks to these operating systems, were able to not be technical and use apps, or use apps rather, computer apps, on their computers for the first time. So ultimately, these are the things that drove mass adoption. It was the operating systems that allowed people into the computing revolution, but it wasn't always like this. It wasn't always point and click, drag and drop, super easy to use. So what came before all of these operating systems? Well, we had a little thing called MS-DOS, and MS-DOS basically required everybody to interact directly with the computer. I couldn't just click file new and make a new document. I had to type in a long command and, and hope that the computer recognized that I typed it properly. So it, it hasn't always been this easy, but then a little thing called Windows came along and totally revolutionized the operating system space. Because for the first time, developers no longer had to interface directly with the computer, and instead they had a layer that allowed them to have different interactions and services that sort of went into the computer for them. They didn't have to know all of the technical jargon just to use a computer. Now, ultimately, like I said, operating systems enabled this mass adoption of computers. But real quick, let's define mass adoption. What is it? You know, I think in crypto, we, we hear mass adoption all the time. People say, oh, when institutional investors get in the space, that's when we have mass adoption. They're going to bring in all the money, and, and then we'll be there. Or, you know, hey, when Block One's hardware wallet comes out, then we'll finally have mass adoption. But what is it really? Now, when we're talking about computers, mass adoption of computers right now is millions of people, and now actually billions of people around the globe, using internet apps every single day. So how do we apply this to blockchains? How do we apply it to crypto? Well, I'd like to argue that mass adoption of blockchains is not institutional investors. It's not a new wallet coming out. It's millions of people using decentralized apps, or dApps, which is a term you'll hear me say a lot, without even really knowing that they're using a blockchain. So where are we today? You know, we know we got to hit a million people. We have to hit our first million users that are using decentralized apps. But where are we in the process? Have we gotten there already? Well, let's look at it. So this is a, a screenshot from a couple months ago. This is Ethereum DAP adoption, which is the top smart contract or top DAP platform by market cap today. So the market values this as the best platform. We look at Ethereum, and there's a key metric I want to show you here from DAPradar.com, and that's users in 24 hours. And you can see the top DAP on Ethereum, which is an exchange, IDEX, has a little bit less than 2,000 daily active users. We're quite a ways away from that mass adoption, unfortunately. But why are so few people using Ethereum DAPs? Why aren't people jumping at, at, at the opportunity to come in and, and use these DAPs that are a part of the future of blockchain? Well, it comes down to what I'd like to call the pyramid of problems. And this is a pyramid that's preventing all of these DAPs from reaching mass adoption within the blockchain space. Now, the first, of course, is one you've probably heard of. It is high fees. Now, right now, if there's a DAP that's built on Ethereum, if I want to trade on IDEX, the number one DAP on Ethereum today, and I, I want to trade a, a token that's worth 25 cents, well, I may have to pay a 50 cent or 75 cent or dollar transaction fee to the network along with that trade, so it really doesn't make sense for me to trade it. Now, if somebody built a decentralized Twitter where, oh, wow, you know, we have this decentralized platform, you control your data, you can come in, your friends can use this platform, and, and Facebook won't monopolize all of your data and sell your personal information. But unfortunately, anytime you click that like button, anytime you hit retweet, you're going to have to pay that 50 cent or 75 cent fee. This is a huge problem with Ethereum and other platforms that's really preventing us from hitting mass adoption. 
But the second point, there's no scalability. Even if people came and said, hey, I'm fine with using decentralized Twitter, I'll pay that 50 cents to hit the like button or pay that 50 cents to retweet, there's no scalability. There's just not enough throughput on the chain to allow people to run highly scalable dApps with millions of users. And the third, of course, is lack of governance. Now, even if all these people got together, they said, hey, we can fix the transaction fee issue. You know, we, we can get together, we'll, we'll find a solution for it. Maybe it's flat rate transaction fees. You know, we want to solve scalability. Unfortunately, it's very hard for the community to get together because there's no built-in governance. There's no mechanism through which people can get together and say, hey, this is how we're going to tackle this problem. This is how we're going to implement the solution. But ultimately, this is not a problem with just Ethereum. This is a problem with so many platforms that exist today. A big one, Bitcoin, has incredibly high fees. We've seen, you know, at the, at the peak of sort of the bull run we had last year, where some people were paying 50, 60, 70 dollar fees. And of course that's come down, but the fees are still there. So any platform you look at, you're going to run into a lot of these issues, at least two out of three of these issues. So how do we solve this pyramid of problems? You know, how do we bust through this and finally start to bring mass adoption of dApps? Well, we have what's called the pyramid of problem solving, aptly named. And of course, the top one, we need a platform with no fees where I can like a post on a decentralized Twitter for free. It happens instantly, it's all very fast and, and easy to use and I'm not paying you know, $5 to like 10 different tweets. Of course, we need a platform that has high scalability. If we're gonna have a million users using any dApp, we need a platform that can support the transaction throughput to enable that. And we need built-in governance. We need a platform that allows us to get together and reach consensus to you know, implement solutions, to solve problems, and eventually move those solutions on chain. And you know, it's interesting, this pyramid, because we actually have a platform that exists and solves this pyramid of problems today, and it's called EOS. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. You know, you're here for a reason. You're here to learn about EOS. So what effect does solving these problems have on dApp adoption? You know, EOS is, is a relatively new platform. It's been around for about five months, but we're starting to see the effect that solving these three crucial issues actually has on dApp adoption today. So as a reminder, of course, we have Ethereum dApp adoption after three years of the platform being in use, a little less than 2,000 users for that top platform. Now here's a screenshot from a couple months ago, two months ago actually, this is EOS dApp adoption after just three months. You can see the top dApp right there, more than 8,000 users, and a few others that are falling in line with Ethereum. So we can see in three months, EOS and those dApps has made about the same progress as Ethereum has in three years, thanks to that pyramid of problem solving. But let's get a bit of an update. Now if we look at EOS dApp adoption after five months, we can see, and if you go to dapradar.com, you can see the full list. There are many now that have more than 1,000 users, which is a great start. But a key point I want to focus on now is actually transactional volume. Now volume is a great indicator generally of you know, how many people are using something. And particularly with a lot of these dApps that are gambling dApps on EOS, this volume has a real cost. You know, there's a house edge on these gambling dApps, so this is generally considered real volume that people are using. But let's look at these numbers. I mean, the top dApp on EOS right now based on volume is a, a dApp called BetDice. You roll the dice, you can play Baccarat, you do all kinds of stuff. But look at the volume in seven day figure. 41 million EOS have gone through that dApp over the last seven days. That's almost a quarter billion dollars funneling through one dApp on EOS in seven days. It's pretty crazy. But for blockchains to really reach mass adoption, for us to bust through that pyramid of problems and, and hit the first million users to have that first killer dApp, we really need a blockchain operating system. Something that allows dApp developers to interface with the blockchain easily so they don't have to write it all themselves. But do we have one today? Does it already exist? Well, let's start by looking at some of the platforms you've probably heard of. We have Bitcoin, of course, but unfortunately, there's no real layer on which to build. Now, if you get out there and you hack with your friends, you can put together some solutions to really make this work, but it's just not designed for it because there's no native smart contract support. Now, with Ethereum, it requires developers to build custom, non-standard interactions with a virtual machine. And this is basically like that example I showed you earlier with MS-DOS where rather than developers just coming in and seeing you know, a standard layer on top of the blockchain, they have to build all of the interactions with the actual Ethereum computer. Very similar to MS-DOS before we got Windows, and it's interesting, they say it's intentionally featureless by design. But ultimately, all of these limitations result in a very, very high barrier to mass adoption. You know, things like high transaction fees, things like lack of scalability, the fact that these dApps, these dApp platforms, aren't really designed to make it easy for developers to come in and build dApps. 
But what would a blockchain operating system look like? What features would it have? Well, first, of course, we need the three things from the pyramid of problems. We need a platform that doesn't have transaction fees, it's highly scalable, it has governance to allow us to change things. But in addition to that, there are some other key features that a blockchain operating system would have that are very similar to the operating systems we have today. The first, of course, human readable account names. Now, raise your hand if you've sent a transaction on Bitcoin, Ethereum, or any other platform. Raise your hand. Awesome, so pretty much everybody here has, has, has sent a transaction there. And you know you have that really, really long public key, which is effectively your account name on Ethereum. You know, 0x, blah, 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 100 characters. And if you miss one, if you mess up on one letter and send a transaction, sorry, your money's gone. You know, you, you hit backspace by mistake, well, it's all gone. But a blockchain operating system would have human readable account names where I can send money to, you know, happy money man on EOS, or he can send it back to me at Finchify. We need human readable account names that function sort of like email addresses. But in addition to that, we need automated virtual machine interaction. We need that layer that, that lets DApp developers interact directly with the blockchain. Developer libraries, and of course, support for so many programming languages, because today, many blockchain platforms require developers to learn yet another new language, rather than taking one that they already know so well. But the one point I want to focus on here today is scalability. Since this is the Scaling Blockchain Conference, let's look at the current state of scalability across the blockchain space. Now, how many transactions per second do we really need? You know, do we need a million transactions per second? Do we need 10 million transactions per second? What is it gonna take for us to hit mass adoption? Well, let's look at Facebook, the most popular internet app today. Facebook alone, just the likes, not the comments, not the logins, not the messages that I'm sending to other people, not the event RSVPs, not all of the other stuff that happens on Facebook. Just the likes on Facebook, more than 52,000 likes happening every single second. So if we wanna put Facebook on a blockchain, if we wanna disrupt the largest software company in the world today, we're gonna to need a platform that does at least 52,083 likes per second. So we need to get there. If we look at Bitcoin, you know, we're a little close, we got three. We can do three transactions per second, all right? So three of you, maybe you, you guys can use Facebook, everybody else, you're gonna to have to wait. And unfortunately, that three trans transactions per second puts Bitcoin at max capacity. So if you wanna get your transaction through, you can cut the line, you can pay a higher fee, you know, and you can make it work. But let's look at Ethereum. 30 transactions per second, but unfortunately also at max capacity. Now this is an order of magnitude improvement on top of Bitcoin, but it's still not enough. We're still not there. So what does EOS look like? Well, EOS, and the reason why I've used such a specific number here, 3,996 transactions per second, that's because that's the most we've ever actually needed to do on the live EOS blockchain. We've never had to go above this number, and this is sort of the max we've hit on the live chain, but there's still plenty of room for more transactions, plenty of room for more dApps to come in and build. Now, it's cool to, to sort of put these on a graph. You know, we hear these numbers, oh, three and 30 and, and almost 4,000, but when you put them on a graph, look what happens. I mean, the, the Bitcoin line here at three is pretty much invisible. And if we look at Ethereum 10 times bigger at, at 30 transactions per second, still just a little tiny orange line. And it's cool to sometimes visualize just how scalable EOS is or was ever required to be. Now, what this ultimately boils down to is that EOS is the only blockchain that's scalable enough right now for mass adoption. Not only does it solve that pyramid of problems with no fees and high scalability and built-in governance, but it's the only operating system that can truly enable dApp developers to build highly scalable dApps thanks to the scalable throughput. Now, the reason why this is made possible is because EOS adds a layer on top of the blockchain for developers and users. Just like Windows added a layer on top of MS-DOS and finally enabled developers to build dApps more easily, it enabled users to use apps without actually having to, to know code, having to type things into a command line, which is very intimidating. And that's why, ultimately, I believe that EOS is the blockchain operating system that we need. It will have an impact on the blockchain and crypto space and bringing it to the mainstream, similar to the effect that Windows had on making computers mainstream. Now, one of the things people always ask me, you know, they say EOS, that's interesting, it's an acronym, right? What does it stand for? People say, oh, it's, you know, Earth's operating system, it's the exponential operating system. There are a lot of cool sort of theories on what the name might mean. But today, based on everything I've presented to you, based on the scalability, based on the built-in governance, based on all of the problems that EOS has solved and the dApps that it has enabled, I'd like to argue that EOS is actually everyone's operating system, thanks to so many of the aspects on the screen right now. Thank you.